Hi, this is Ray Stundle, co-author of Path to Riches by the Napoleon Hill Foundation, co-founder of the Silicon Valley Product Management Association, a 501c6, and the CEO of Ray Stundle International. Thank you, thank you so much for making time to watch this video. I promise you, you're going to get a lot out of this video. You have shared with me your most precious resource that you have, and that is your time. You can always make more money in life, but you can't make more time. So in this video, I'm going to teach you and share some very great important information. I'm going to show you the number one thing that you need to do when you start out to build a product or a service. I'm going to share with you the purpose of marketing and the number one thing you absolutely have to do to ensure that you have alignment within your marketing strategy. And I'm going to also share with you the, the purpose of sales and I'm going to share with you the eight steps that you have to go through in order to have a successful sale and it's an eight step sales process that I'm going to share with you. And as I go along and share all this information I have a number of tips that I really think are going to make a big difference to you. So what I want you to do is watch this video, really listen for what I'm teaching you and know that I'm going to share everything that I've talked about or most of the things I've talked about plus a whole lot more in a separate document that are is really my talking notes for this video and what I've prepared for you here today to make sure that I give you a ton of value up front even before you even know who I really am. So let's take a look at the first key step and that's all about building product. When you want to build a product or a service, which is the first step in, in order to make any kind of money in any kind of business, you have to have a market driven product. The other model is to have a product driven model where you make something and you hope somebody buys it. Trust me, that doesn't work. You need to start first with understanding what the market needs and then be able to create a product that meets that need. So that means you have to do something called market analysis. Now, I know that may sound quite simple and you may have done that already, but let me share a couple of ideas and ask yourself if you have done these things so far in your business, okay? So the first step is to define the market problem very clearly. What is the market problem that you intend to solve or that you are solving? And this is something that I really encourage you to spend a lot of time thinking about and get very specific because if that market problem you are solving is not really relevant and people don't acknowledge that as a problem, you're not going to be in business for very long. Now, as you develop and understand what the market problem is, the next step is to analyze your customers. As you analyze your customers, I want you to make a, a list on a piece of paper and I want you to draw a line down the middle. On the left, I want you to write down customer attributes I like. And on the right, customer attributes I don't like. And I want you to think about the customers that you have and make a list of all the attributes. So you might think of customer A and they're like, well, they pay on time. Well, that's an attribute that I like. And there might be an attribute on the customer list that I don't like. They're very difficult to work with. They don't return my phone calls. Make a list and understand what are the attributes that you really want to shoot for. Because that's the first step is gaining clarity in order to attract the right customers to you. Okay, the next step here has to do with further analyzing your customers. And there are many different ways to do this. I like to share uh, one of the more simple ways of doing it. And it's called the five W's. You may have heard of it before. Write down on a piece of paper, a new piece of paper. Trust me, you're going to go through a lot of piece of papers here. Um, the next piece of paper is going to have the five W's. I want you to write down who, what, when, where, and why, and let's throw in how. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And I want you to start asking yourself questions using these words at the very beginning of the sentence. Who exactly are my customers? What exactly do they want? What do they need? What is their pain? Why would they buy from me? Why would they buy from my competitor? How do they like to buy? Where do they like to buy? When do they like to buy? Who is part of the decision making process to make a purchasing decision? You see, there's so many great questions you can ask as it relates to your customers using these words in the beginning. As you write all these questions down, I want you to really think about them because depending on who you're focusing as part of your customer segment, they're going to have different answers. Some people that you're working with may like to deal with you and make a purchasing decision in person. Other people may be very comfortable to simply buy it on a website and they don't need to talk to you. It's very important that you get clear on this. Now the next part of this analysis is hot buttons. 
You see, customers make a purchasing decision typically for one or two key benefits that are important to them. And it's up to you to figure out what those benefits are for your marketplace so that you can then build a product that solves those needs so that you can then do marketing around those needs and so that you can use those hot buttons in the sales process, which we're going to be talking about. And that's very clear. Why exactly are they buying? What exactly is that hot button for them? After you do all of this, and we've talked about customers, the other side of the market is competitors. We all have competitors. If you don't have competitors, then that's a problem because that means that there are less people out there who have proven that your business model works. So competitors are great. And you know, I, I encourage you to welcome competitors. Competitors make us better. But I want you to understand and figure out how you are differentiated from your competition. What makes you special? What makes you outstanding? And I want you to ask yourself how you compare to your competitors against this acronym. And again, you may have heard of this before, but many people have heard of it. Few have actually implemented it. And I want you to implement it. It stands for SWOT. S-W-O-T. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I want you to ask yourself, what are the strengths of each of my competitors? What are the weaknesses of each of my competitors relative to what you offer? And I want you to ask yourself, after all of this, what are some opportunities for you to catapult yourself forward? I want you to ask yourself, what are some threats that you can be careful of and how you navigate moving forward? You see, if you take a look at the SWOT analysis and if you take a look at your environment analysis, you will see that there is various factors that play into the success of your product or service. For example, if we take a look at various trends, like technological trends, one of the uh, common examples is what has happened to the movie going experience in the last few years. You remember we started off with VHS tapes and I know some of you are like, what is a VHS tape? Don't worry, work with me on that. Then some people then moved on and started l using DVDs and we moved to Blu-ray uh, DVDs and, and what are we at now? We're looking at downloading streaming media and enjoying content on demand from the internet. You see, all of these technological changes have significantly impacted many different businesses, from your corner video store, rental store, all the way through to the equipment that's in your home. And I want you to think about how change and technology and what's happening in the market around you is going to impact your ability to deliver your product or service. Okay, there's many more steps that we could talk about in terms of analyzing a market, but it, for the sake of time and talking about the next two pillars, I'm going to move on. But here's what I want to leave you with. For this section, please focus on your customers, your competitors, and your core competencies, the three C's. And I want you to get really clear on how you see yourself as a unique and differentiated offering so that your clients really look to you as a solution provider and not just another vendor in the marketplace doing what everybody else is doing. Okay, let's talk about number two, marketing. What is the purpose of marketing? Marketing, to me at least, is, is about creating a list of qualified leads who need what I have, who want what I have, and have the capacity to pay for what I have. See, all the marketing in the world that generates all the awareness in the world, if it doesn't lead to a qualified lead that can be put through a defined sales process that can lead to a sale, which can lead to revenue, which can cover the costs of the business that will allow you to drive a profit, means that you won't be in business very long. So the purpose of marketing must be to identify qualified business leads. Now, we've talked about customer analysis before in the previous section, and this is where you get to go a little bit deeper as a marketing expert. This is where you need to go and understand the attributes of your perfect customer in terms of demographics, psychographics. You need to understand their buying behavior. Now, I know that may have sounded complicated, but it's really not. Demographics are all the things we can observe around somebody. Their age, their education level, where they live, their ethnicity, their gender, their sex. Those are things that we can observe. 
And psychographics more have to do with why somebody's buying. What's the driver behind it? People like to move away from pain and towards something that they enjoy. They want to reach for something they enjoy and they want to alleviate pain. They want to get rid of problems. And at the end of every buying decision, people are looking for improvement. They're looking for ways in which they can improve their personal life, the way they can improve their business life. Your job is to understand what type of improvement they're looking for. Now, as you look at buying behavior, it's the whole process that goes on into how a decision gets made to purchase your product. And I want you to focus in on who are the decision makers, who are the influencers, and who are the users. Users, influencers, decision makers. It's absolutely critical you understand this because at the end of the day, you may be doing a great job connecting with the user and a great job connecting with the decision maker, but then comes the influencer. And the influencer comes along and says, no, that one I like better. That one is faster. That one is quicker. That one looks nicer. Oh, that one has a better brand reputation. And what happens? The decision maker goes, hmm. Well, that's, that's something I didn't think about. And then what happens? The gap widens between you and the, the person that is going to sign their name on the, bottom, on the bottom line. So it's very important you understand the buying behavior and who's involved in the process. Now let's get to something real specific that I know will make a big difference to you. And it stands for USP. USP stands for Unique Selling Proposition. Unique Selling Proposition. And, or a unique sales proposition. And this is absolutely critical. All your marketing needs to be anchored around this and support this important phrase. You see, a unique selling proposition is a simple phrase that is able to communicate uniquely. How are you unique? It sets you apart from your competition. It gives your customer a reason to consider you as a value-added um, offering as a value-added vendor, as somebody that they can trust, somebody who has a new and improved way of looking at the problem. Sales, this unique sales proposition, sales, it's a way of persuading others to exchange money for your product or service. Proposition, it suggests an offer that can be accepted. So there are some key components that I want you to remember. A unique sales proposition always includes the biggest benefit that you can offer always does. It solves a problem. It is guaranteed. And I want to give you some examples. So let's play along here. I'm going to give you the USP and I want you to think who the, who the vendor or company is. All right, here we go. We tr we're number two and we try harder. Who said that? The company Avis. They took advantage of being in second place from a market share perspective and basically communicated that their whole company is focused on trying harder to be in number one position. How about the second one? Ultimate driving machine. Which company focuses on being the ultimate driving machine? It's BMW. How about it's the real thing? I guess as opposed to the imitation, perhaps? Who said it's the real thing? Well, back when Coke and Pepsi were battling and they still continue to, Coke, it says, it's the real thing. Ladies, you're gonna love this one. Diamonds are forever. You probably have heard that, but I bet you, you may or may not realize it's De Beers, one of the largest, largest producers of diamonds in the world. How about this one? Kids, if you're watching this, you're gonna love this. The milk chocolate that melts in your mouth, not in your hands. M&Ms, right? Okay, so you can see that each of these statements sums up to a big extent what the company is all about. In pursuit of perfection, or the, the pursuit of perfection, Lexus. Okay, so if we take a look at all of these, what I want you to take away from this is that you need to have a USP, it needs to be clear, it needs to be benefit driven, it needs to solve a problem, and you need to be building a market strategy around it and including it within all of your marketing collateral and your website and so forth. Let's talk a little bit about sales. I love this topic. Sales. Nothing ever happens in this world until somebody sells somebody something. Just think about it. Everything in your home was sold to you and you purchased it. So nothing happens until something gets sold. So what is the purpose of sales? 
Well, to me, effective sales is all about transferring the enthusiasm that you have to somebody else such that they are in a place where they have overwhelming desire to buy. So it's about transferring enthusiasm and giving your prospect a reason to make a purchasing decision and to have that level of excitement and enthusiasm and desire to purchase. Okay, I want to share with you, and this is my favorite part of the presentation, the eight steps of the sales process that you absolutely have to analyze and master and continue to refine, okay? Step number one is called prospecting. And I'm gonna go through them all, and as we go through them, you'll be able to take notes, and you're gonna see how they all support each other. So we're gonna talk about prospecting. Prospecting is all about finding the people who can and will buy your product or service for a reasonable price within a reasonable time period. They have the capacity to buy, they have a need for what it is you do, and they are uh, really somebody who you need to be focusing on. Now I want to differentiate prospect versus suspect. You see, a suspect is anybody who listens to your marketing message. They're not qualified. And your job as a marketer and as a salesperson is to continue to refine and qualify your prospect such that they are the right person for your message. It's all about having a market to message match. So you need to identify your ideal client. We've talked a little bit about that earlier on. You need to get very clear on what is the pain, the problem, the need, and the goal that your prospect has. You see, if you have a product or service that addresses a specific pain or problem, and at the same time meets a need and is helping your prospect go from A to B and reach the goal that they have, well then, you're going to be very successful with that prospect. And that's really important for you to figure out who it is that you're targeting. So I want you to, I want to give you an idea here that I think is, it could be really useful. You see, nowadays it's really quite straightforward to create a video, very much like I'm doing here today. And I want you to make a video where you impart a lot of value and you show who you really are and help your prospect go from where they are to where they need to go. Help them relate to you and give them value up front. And if you do this, you're going to be able to really help your, um, your marketing efforts and your sales efforts in qualifying and dealing with the people who best can, can benefit from what you have to offer. Okay, let's talk about number two, appointment setting. Once you go through the prospecting process, then it comes the next step, appointment setting. Make sure you are talking to the right person, folks. How many times does it happen? You may start out the, talking to somebody, thinking they're the right person, and they're not the right person, and you've wasted all that time and effort. And they may like your stuff, but they're not the right person. They're not the person who can make that purchasing decision. For example, door-to-door -door sales. You knock on somebody's door, somebody who doesn't live there answers the door, and you try and sell something to them. It's not gonna work. So you have to make sure you're talking to the right person. You need to start with a very clear benefit-driven opening sentence to capture their attention so that they're willing to give you 10 minutes of their time and talk about how your product or service can meet the needs that you have already been able to uncover. So that's absolutely key. I want you to focus in the appointment setting stage of just getting the appointment. Never, 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 ever sell over the phone unless your customer can buy over the phone. Very important and key to remember. They're gonna try and get you to tell you what exactly is this and try and get it out of you. Refuse to give it to them. You have to get in front of the prospect if that's how they can purchase. Number three, establish rapport and trust. Nothing ever happens in sales unless your prospect trusts you as the salesperson. And they have to like you and you have to be trusted. In order to do this, I like to suggest that you ask lots of open, thought-provoking questions. Ask questions about their business environment and how things are going. Ask questions about their personal life. Get to know your prospect by asking lots of questions. Let the prospect talk. Let them talk. Telling is not selling. Selling and telling just do not go together. The more they talk, the more you listen. The more you listen, the more you understand. And therefore, when you talk, you say something that meets the need and is right on target, okay? So I want you to also think about how you can explain when it is your time to talk and you have done a sufficient amount of listening, explain how your product or service has helped others 
in the situation that they're in. Notice what I just said. You haven't talked about how you can help them. You've talked about how you can help have helped others. This is addressing the need for stability and security that people have of not being taken advantage of. Using testimonials is a very great strategy at this step, uh, this stage of the selling process. Now, I want you to listen intently and again, the more you do that, the more the prospect's going to like and really start to trust you. So now comes number four. As you're going through this process of building rapport and getting to know the person, you need to start to identify their needs. And in order to identify their needs, you've got to continue to ask good questions, you've got to listen carefully, you've got to be observant, you've got to pay attention, and you need to really focus on what is those hot buttons. What are those hot buttons that they're trying to move past that you have a solution for? And I want you to really see yourself as a solution doctor. That's right, a solution doctor. Now, work with me on this. Imagine that you go to a doctor, and you make an appointment, you go to the doctor, and the doctor comes in, takes about 10 seconds, looks you up and down, and says, that's it, this is your problem, here's a prescription, he hands it to you and walks out the door. What would you think of that experience? Well, that's what happens every day in sales when people do not take time to listen and understand. And sometimes you may even have the solution for them. But I want you to pause, I want you to hold back, I want you to listen, I want you to ask more questions, and as you do that, you're going to be able to refine your solution and provide a solution that fits like a hand in a glove. Okay, let's talk about number five, that's making the presentation. The presentation has to be carefully constructed, it needs to go from the general to the specific, and it needs to factor in all of the various components that are needed for that prospect to make an intelligent decision. You need to repeat the information in terms of the needs that you have been able to uncover, and address how your product or service fulfills those needs. Now when you do that, don't fall into the mistake of just talking about features. Remember, customers never, ever, ever just buy features. They buy benefits. So I want you to imagine this, this as a metaphor. Imagine that you got a big pipe, and on one side you drop in features, and it goes down the pipe, down the hill, and then the pipe empties into a bucket. And out comes results and benefits. That's what they buy at the end of the day. They buy results and benefits. The features are used to get results and benefits. So that's what you need to focus on. So as you identify the features that your product has to help solve a problem and get them the results and the benefits that they need, I want you to remember there's a middle step. You see, every product has a set of features and that those set of features demonstrate certain benefits for that product. But depending on how the customer uses the product, they're going to get another set of benefits. It's very important that you can meet these translations and show how the customer benefit relates to the product benefit which relates to the feature and how that feature relates to the need that the customer has. Very, very important stuff. Okay, so the next part here is you need to also focus on the ADA formula for sales. ADA, well known, stands for attention, grab the attention, I, cultivate interest, D, cultivate desire, and A, get your prospect to take action. And as you go through this process using a variety of different tools and techniques, they ultimately become very enthusiastic and have the desire and take that action and your job as a salesperson, remember what I said, to transfer enthusiasm and interest from you to the prospect is able to take place. Okay, let's talk about number six. It's answering objections. Objections are gonna come up. And remember this, objections are your friends. People only object when they care. If people didn't care, they would shut up, they would stop talking, they would walk out the door, they would not even give you the chance. So remember, every time you say an objection coming, I want you to view this as saying, wow, they're giving me an opportunity here to see how I can handle it. They're giving me a chance. They're engaging with me. And they're in the conversation. And as long as the conversation is alive, you're alive in the sales process. So what I want you to do is make a list of all the objections that you hear. I want you to just really think about it, about all the different objections that you have heard and come up with answers that are able to position yourself back on track and how you can handle each objection. You have to develop clear and convincing answers on each. You need to create the response that explains how your objection can easily be handled and why it's really not a big deal and it's, it's, a, it's not a reason to stop proceeding and get them back on track. Number seven is confirming the sale. Now, 
Well, this is also known in the industry as closing. But I like to go by Jim Cathcart's definition of confirming the sale. You see, you're, you're, when you close something, it's closed. It really isn't when somebody buys the first step in a long-term relationship. And that's why I like confirming the sale. So credit to, to Jim Cathcart for uh, terming it that way. And when we talk about confirming the sale, I want you to think about, ask yourself, if you are actually asking the customer to make a buying decision. Because that's actually when you're confirming the sale. Sometimes you might get to the end of the presentation and the, sale, the, the person will say, well, I'll think about that. And then the salesperson goes, okay, and they walk out. That's just not gonna work. That just does not work. You have to be able to ask for the sale and in doing so, you're gonna do it in multiple ways and in multiple circumstances so that um, you can basically overcome that resistance that there is for people to purchase your products or services. And there's many approaches to do this. One of them that I like and I want to suggest to you is a more straightforward, simple way of doing it and it's called the invitational close. And it basically goes something like this. You basically say to the customer, do you have any questions or concerns that I have not covered so far? And you stay quiet and you listen. The customer might be thinking, they might Say, here's an objection. So you address the objection. You finish the objection, come back. Do you have any other questions or concerns that I have not covered? And once they say no, then what you say is, well then, why don't you give it a try? Or if you're selling a service, say, well then, why don't you give us a try? And at that point, be quiet. Mum's the word. Shh. The first person who talks loses. So please remember that whenever you go for the confirmation of the sale, be quiet and don't say anything. And what you'll find is that the more experienced person that you're dealing with, the more they'll be quiet and they'll look at you and you'll look at them. It actually could quite become quite humorous. But by and large, as long as you stay quiet, you have a much better chance of them saying yes and saying, okay, let's go forward. There's many more ways of confirming the sale, but this is just one strategy that I wanted to share with you. Let's talk about number eight. Number eight is about resales. It's about referrals. It's about being able to take advantage of your warm market. It's about customers that you've given a great experience to from the beginning to the end and after the sale. It's absolutely critical. You give them great service after the sale and you are interested in them giving you referrals and reselling to a happy customer, by the way, is 10 times easier than cold calling because they already know who you are. They can already relate to you. You've already gone through the process. You've already done the dance. They already know who you are. So I want you to ask for referrals and make that a standard part of your process. I want you to compensate the people who give you referrals, whether with services or with, uh, with financial incentives or simply acknowledging them and giving them a gift certificate to go out to dinner. Now, it's 15 times easier to sell to a referral from a satisfied customer than it is a brand new prospect. Because now you have somebody who's rooting for you. Somebody who is an acting, living, breathing testimonial that has, been, has experienced a great experience from you. So keep that in mind. It's absolutely critical. So in summary, I have talked to you about three important pillars. I've talked to you about building a product or service. We talked about the importance of market analysis and I've left you with a few to-do items and one of those to-do items was the three C's, customers, competitors, and your core competency and how you are uniquely differentiated to do very well in the marketplace. We talked about effective marketing. What exactly is it? And I gave you some specific tips around USPs. We also talked about psychographics and demographics. We talked about customers buying behavior. Talked about quite a few things there. And we've also talked about sales. And we've talked about the eight steps in the sales process in order for you to maximize revenue. And I've given you some tips all along the way. I'm sure you would agree all businesses need to have amazing products or services, incredible marketing to demonstrate that and an understanding for the market and to build qualified leads, and an incredible sales process to be able to take those great leads and convert those leads into happy customers who provide revenue for the business so that the business can grow. Thanks for watching. This is Ray Stendhal helping you drive profitable growth.